Right, warm greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today in person. And for those of you who are joining us online. And thank you um, to the Global Environment Facility for hosting us today. Uh, we will start uh, by observing two minutes of silence for Armistice Day. It's the uh, 11th of day of the 11th month to, to commemorate the fallen of the First World War and the uh, agreement of the peace. So we have an exciting program, a packed program ahead of us um, with a fabulous lineup of speakers uh, bringing a rich set of perspectives, speaking to the imperative of making our cities equitable and inclusive as a key driver for ambitious climate action. Uh, we, ha we do have a very tight program, so without further delay, I would like to invite um, uh, Gustavo um, Fonseca, the Director of Pro Pro Global Programs at the Global Environment Facility, and Ani Dasgupta, President and CEO of the World Resources Institute, who will be providing some opening remarks. And uh, Gustavo, thanks again for hosting us here today, and I'll turn it over to you for opening remarks. Thank you very much, Leo, and good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, my name is Gustavo Fonseca. I'm the Director of Programs at the Global Environment Facility uh, Secretariat. So a warm welcome to all of you to the JAF GCF uh, Pavilion, uh, which has been in operation since the COP began. Uh, and uh, today we have a very important day uh, at the COP. We, this is the, uh, the day dedicated to cities. Uh, yesterday we had Transport Day, so this uh, idea of having themes for every day of the COP was a, a brilliant one. So let's uh, make the best use of uh, the opportunity we have to discuss cities. We are really glad to host uh, uh, many of our strategic partners uh, to discuss important topics, uh, like the one uh, we are discussing today on the role of cities uh, in climate action. Uh, the GEF is uh, a financial mechanism of the UNFCCC, of the Climate Convention, and is committed to promoting strategies to tackle complex challenges uh, and the underlying drivers of global environmental degradation. And in this context, uh, in 2014, the GEF piloted an integrated approach to transform key economic systems. And given the importance of the urban system, we launched the Sustainable Cities Integrated Program uh, just after the Paris Agreement uh, was uh, agreed upon. We have uh, come a long way since then with the launching of another uh, uh, phase of this program, which is called the Urban Shift, covering 50 cities now, and uh, we propose to expand further in what we call GEF 8, which is the next replenishment cycle that's currently being negotiated with our donors, and we launch uh, uh, a full steam in July of next year. Uh, over this period, uh, there were no, very number, great number of efforts uh, uh, of institutions like uh, WRI, uh, Glo the Global City Network, uh, the, the development banks, and many others. And we, ha we have seen a great evolution in the work uh, of the Jeff with the cities, and, uh, and also with the city networks as key actors in shaping global policy discourse and climate actions. Cities, of course, are central to the race to zero and the race to achieve lasting resilience. Uh, because of the GEF uh, is a financial mechanism not only of this convention but of uh, uh, four other conventions in addition to uh, providing financing for international waters, we learned very early that uh, it's important to integrate actions across sectors and uh, provide financing to developing countries in a much more uh, robust and, uh, and coherent way, uh, looking at synergies and looking at how we can make the money go further. So cities are clearly the, the spaces where sustainable solutions can uh, achieve that and can benefit people in an integrated manner. Our, our integration approach has come with a strong people-centered uh, uh, focus with emphasis on, on gender, uh, on resilience and inclusion so that climate action can uh, have benefits that uh, are equitable uh, overall. In, the, in this context, urban equity uh, clearly became a, re a current uh, relevant topic for us in this area of rapid urban growth and urban transformation. This event and the latest report by WRI on this topic are thus extremely timely. So I'm delighted to uh, join in this event uh, along with Ani Dasgupta, the CEO of uh, uh, WRI. And Ani has been a great champion of the city's program, has been with us uh, from the very beginning. And uh, thank you for all of you for gathering with us today 
on this team. So thanks, Sans, again, and uh, over to you, Annie. Thank you, Gustavo. I just, uh, before we move on, I just want to think about this for a minute, uh, what Gustavo, his own leadership, and Jeff was set up at, at Rio for environment, uh, to protect the environment. And Jeff is one of the first multilateral that actually recognized the importance of getting cities right for the environment. And Jeff has had a program since the last cycle, and this is the third cycle we're talking about, and Gustavo has been central to it. And I'm very glad, Gustavo, we are doing this event um, uh, here on inequality in cities. Uh, and you and your, uh, uh, and your leadership have been fantastic. Before I move on, I believe there is a, Leo, there is a video before, uh, for us, right? So we can just stand here and see it, Gustavo. Not everyone experiences cities in the same way. Daily activities are easy for some and a struggle for others. The gap between those with access to basic services and those without creates daily burdens and disparities that echo for generations. This is the urban services divide. Over a billion people globally and two in three urban residents in low income countries are underserved. For them, Water may be available only a few hours a week, and access to jobs requires arduous and unsafe journeys. The results are costly, time-consuming, self-provision, and unhealthy, polluting practices. The cumulative human and environmental cost of the urban services divide impacts everyone. Closing it benefits us all. So can I invite the first panel? So Wanjira, Vijay, where's Ingrid? I just saw Ingrid. Oh, uh, come and sit. And I think we're missing one, and if, whenever he comes, he can join us, right? Uh, please, and he'll introduce you in a minute. So thank you for being here. So you saw the video, and it, to be honest, this, this particular event is my favorite event uh, so far, Jeff, for the following reason, um, is that um, over the last seven years, um, not seven, five years, we've been working to gather evidence of what cities work and what inequality does to cities and how cities can be successful. And, and we, about three weeks back, uh, put together the synthesis of that work some of the people involved, 160 people, authors, reviewers, were involved in this process. I'm very glad to see two of them right here in front of me, and they'll speak in the next panel um, uh, in this process. Why are you shaking your head? Um, uh, and uh, um, the most important part of the outcome of this thinking, of, the, of this analysis, was um, two-thirds of people who live in cities across the world don't actually have services that makes them uh, perform, I mean, be in a city. And the reason is the reason we looked at cities this way, because how does the cities look like from a citizen's perspective, people who live there, and how they actually use the city is through services, water, sanitation, electricity, transport, parks, healthcare, anything you can think of is a service a city has that you actually use the city, that that's how you interact with the city. So we looked at cities from the perspective of a user and found Two-thirds of uh, people, um, sorry, uh, two-thirds of people in the global south don't have access to services in adequate level. In some cities, in 90 percent, you just saw this uh, video of the what we call the urban service gap. Now, you might have guessed that yeah, there's not enough service in cities, but you didn't know. Or I hope the magnitude of this and the reason it matters is if people don't have services, say they don't have transport services, spend two hours getting to work and spending one third of their income, it actually does matter to the productivity of city and the well-being of the family. Or, or they have, don't have water supply, which costs sometimes 50 times of what a pipe water costs. Is not only is expensive, it actually boiling it to make it um, drinkable is another huge waste of energy. Or if you think about energy access, the 800 billion people in the world that don't have energy access, they're not all of them don't live in cities, a uh, lot of them do. Um, and if they don't have energy access, two things happen. One is maybe they get energy access from diesel generator, that's poor enough. But a lot of the industry in these cities we're talking about are home-based. 
And if you don't have predictable energy, you have your productivity or your income matters. So it does matter a lot if you have access to services for a majority of people for three reasons, for productivity of income, but mostly for climate. I mean, you can't get, our analysis shows that you can't get to this 1.5 degree world that all of us absolutely need without getting <laughs> cities right. Uh, or cities successful where everyone, especially low-income people, have access to service so they can participate in a most um, creative uh, and most productive way and have a thriving life. I mean, that's, that's what we all want. We just want to, we don't want a decarbonized world only. We want a successful world where people, decarbonization and nature can live together. So this is the core of it. That's what we're going to discuss. I just, all the things we only last thing I want to say, cities is not a sector. You know, we talked about transport here, we have talked about water, we talked about energy um, a lot during COP. Cities is a place, it's, it's like a uh, engine of productivity, of, of momentum, of political change. That can be a real driver to shifting what we need to do. What we need to do is a collective action problem, it's not just a technical problem. And cities have shown over and over again that cities can be a leader. There's 1,000 cities that are signed up to Race to Zero um, um, before this COP. And how we actually make cities a much more central part of how we bring this change that we need is very important, I think, going forward. The report that we published that you, I, I hope you have a chance to look at actually doesn't not only talk about this problem, uh, documents hundreds of cases across the world that people, cities, poorer cities, have taken action to solve this problem collectively on, on water, on sanitation, on transportation. Um, and that is what I, we think there is a path forward, but it needs to be done at a scale that is not happening yet. Cities, cities were invented 10,000 years back, about approximately. They were invented to increase productivity, to increase quality of life for culture, most importantly for innovation. And those things are still possible to do. But the last 100 years, the way we are building cities, we're actually limiting these things happening. And we just have to build cities that are good for everyone, but good for all these things of productivity gain, of innovation gain. So I'm going to lead with this question to my fantastic panel. My first panel is going to be Vijay, who heads FCDO which is a very important part of the British government, and I hope he gets some sleep after this because he has his role with the presidency. But no, more than that, Vijay, you were the ambassador before this job in Brazil, where it's one of the most urbanized places in the world, in the developing world, and also has the highest level of inequality. I would love to hear your perspective how cities and inequality, and how do you see FCDO uh, how do you see this at FCDO, which is such an important partner in this? Let's check. Annie, thank you, and it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, we will get some sleep, but only once we've completed <laughs> COP26, I'm sure with all of you. Um, so, uh, as you said, Annie, we've been working on this report. It's a great report. I mean, I could just echo everything you've said. The thing that struck me most about working in cities in, in India in Mexico, in Brazil, which is where I've, uh, I have, has been, in addition to what you've said, the sheer creativity and the speed of decision making. Shifting whole nations, moving the whole of adaptation, mitigation, all the things we've been talking about, you can do it much more quickly in cities. But also, I think they're at the sharp end of the problems that climate change are going to cause. And I think our fundamental worries, and we've seen this a bit during COVID, is that the inequalities get sharper in cities, and they're more apparent in cities. So that's where the politics and the decision making has to happen extremely quickly. What we're trying to do, and we're, we're, you've mentioned Race to Zero and all the other programs that we're funding, is look at what the real solutions are and help the local mayors, the leaders of these cities to integrate all the planning. There are several issues. One is, and we all know how this works, cities have silo decision making just like we all do. None of the issues we are dealing with today and none of the climate change issues can be siloed. You can't take out the transport from inequality. You can't take out the parks, as you mentioned. You certainly can't take out water. And I just want to mention water and pause for a moment on that. We are seeing around the world over abstraction of water. It's very heavily done in cities. The cities in many areas then sink. It makes even, I mean, physically sink. It makes the, uh, the uh, problems of, uh, of adaptation, uh, particularly for those coastal cities, even worse than they would otherwise have been. 
I think in many cities that we know on the coast, they are sinking faster than sea level is rising by an order of magnitude. So that's the problem, not sea level rise. Third issue is transport, the decarbonization of transport. And the frustrating thing about that is we know how to do it. We are in the process of decarbonizing and have decarbonized transport in many cities of the world. So it's investment at scale and making the infrastructural changes. And we have seen some fantastic examples of leadership in cities around the world to decarbonize transport and simultaneously to make it more accessible. That was one, by the way, uh, just come back to a Brazilian example, one of the projects we were running and we had fantastic partnerships in Sao Paulo, one of the world's mega cities. But what you see there is people and quite often uh, women and the poorest being heavily disadvantaged by the transport systems. Uh, it is quite hard, and I have tried it, to cycle in Sao Paulo, but it's getting an awful lot better. And e-bikes make a city even the size of that with the climate it has really accessible. Transport and safe transport with the technology that we can have, again, it works. And what we saw in many of the projects we did was that with a concrete, medium-term strategic transport plan, you can do a combination of reducing inequality, decarbonizing, creating jobs, economic growth, and reducing pollution. And believe me, the pollution in Sao Paulo at times can be pretty brutal. So I think those are the kinds of examples of things we distinctly from part of the UK want to finance. Share that best practice. And I think just to end before I could go on for hours on this, but uh, create a community of cities who between them work. I, I actually think there is a powerful dynamic here and the race to zero and a lot of this day, which as you said, Annie, we have been theming days very specifically is you create a community of cities and they will go further, faster, more creatively than, and I say this as a member of a federal government, than federal governments will ever be able to do. We are not necessarily part of the solution here. We may be part of the problem. I think our job is get out of the way and let the cities invent the technologies, implement them and learn for each other uh, as much as possible. Thank you. Can I ask you a follow-up question and you can give a short answer? Um, because you, you're one of the premier development agencies, you had that in part of the British government. Um, this, this work that we're just talking about, one of the central theses that comes out is that decarbonization and inequality cannot live together. You can't decarbonize without actually thinking about inequality. It's something you and I talked about a few days back. Do you think this, because DFID or FCDO historically was a very much a poverty reduction was the key. Now it's very much, seems to me the evidence is these two things are coming together. Um, I would love to hear a reflection on that. So just in financing terms, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is committed to doubling international climate financing to 11.6 billion. It's going to be a very, very large part of our ODA spend, our aid spend. It is also absolutely crucial to the development agenda as a whole. And I think that's exactly your point, Annie. If the threat, I mean, people have called it climate adaptation and we've certainly seen it in COVID, development in reverse. If we manage to get the responses to climate adaptation right, we can simultaneously help development hugely. And I think that comes down to picking really carefully what our investments are, working very much, and again, big theme of your life, I hope you've all seen in COP, a really big theme about working with international finance, the multilateral development banks, the real leverage they can get, and then finally, the massive leverage of the private sector. So the challenge we all face, and cities are fascinating for this, is how do we harness all of this together? Um, there's just been a, an event at an another uh, pavilion with the governor of a Brazilian state and his confederation of industry, exactly because they are working together in order to make the changes to decarbonize their cities. And that is, I think, exactly the sorts of partnerships that we want to stimulate and create, show they can be effective and do it. Just coming back to us for a minute. So we're going to be focusing very heavily on and taking stock after COP of, of what we're going to do on climate adaptation. Mitigation is going to happen and you can see it and you've seen the zero electric vehicles work yesterday you've seen the decarbonizing power work but on adaptation it is much more complicated and much more local 
And again, I think that brings us back to the role of cities here, because there you've got decision-making structures who can take local decisions at speed and experiment in a way that others can't. So we are going to be focusing heavily in our adaptation work coming on coastal cities, on helping cities get more compact, something I just want to stress for a moment. The urban sprawl we've seen has both environmental and transport and people impacts enormously. And one of the things raised in the report was the need for cities to get more compact. That's a fascinating change. But as people move into those, we can therefore, uh, I think, help both the livability of cities if we do it right, um, and their use of resources and their environmental impact. So all of those at the same time over the next five years. <laughs> Thank you, Vijay. I, I very much agree the focus on, I hope, a lot more focus at this COP has been on, on adaptation. Adaptation finance can be a really gateway to getting this development and decarbonization together. And hopefully we'll see more on current side. You are doubling your investments there, others are. So let's, uh, let's move to Ingrid. Ingrid Hoven is uh, well known to a lot of us, so hopefully everyone here. She now leads a GIZ. She's been in development field for a long time. Um, and the uh, German government at the World Bank, and now GIZ, I think now must be the biggest technical assistance agency in the world, I think, right? So from, so which is, and you're present in multiple countries, many more countries than most um, technical, uh, technical aid, uh, aid agencies. Um, Ingrid, from your perspective, um, what was GIZ's view would be to, to capture this moment? of cities and equality, and exactly what Vijay said of the way forward. How do we bring this together? Yeah, thank you, um, Ani, and thank you for having me. I, I first would like really to commend you for this excellent report, and those of you who haven't read it yet, you should really have a look at it. It's, it's a remarkable knowledge knowledge piece. I, I would like to underline one, one issue that is perhaps sometimes, sometimes forgotten, um, what can actually um, be the impact of a city which is a huge inequality issue? Um, what we have experienced during the corona pandemic is actually that if people are excluded, they lose trust in governments at the national level, but also at the local level. And then you see um, a sudden erosion of social cohesion. And this may lead actually to an emerging security issue to social tensions, and in an environment where you're actually dealing with these type of uh, phenomena, actually how much attention a local government can, can play to get a, a city towards net zero. And this is what we have observed already during the corona pandemic, that some of the medium term, longer term investments that were already like embedded in investment pipeline has been postponed because the local government was under severe pressure um, due to scarcity of resources, a reduction in tax income, and because they were feeling that actually the social cohesion was eroding dramatically. Um, so I think this is one additional factor that we have to bear in mind, perhaps in our narrative to make sure that decision makers capture the equality issue when it comes to cities development. I would like to share with you three, three factors which have already partially mentioned um, in, in our debate. So. Um, if you want to establish equal cities against climate change, I think um, we have to take on board and recognize the complexity of cities. So if you move, want to move one piece, like for instance, you want to move tr the transport sector towards net zero and towards more climate friendliness, and this requires a lot of additional work and planning by other departments. You have to perhaps uh, reconsider your the land use within the city. You have to reconsider um, perhaps the type of um, education policy that you want to conduct. So, and this is not that easy if you have such a cross-sectoral issue like climate change and you want to embed it into policy. If you have also at the local level a governance structure that is working in silos, and how can you achieve that? Actually, people take on board these sect cross cross-level endeavors and make sure that they do it in a coherent way. And this is easier said than done when, it, when you want to put this into practice. But I think this is an absolutely key factor to get out of the box, um, reach out across the aisle, and make sure that the other um, actors, stakeholders, actually work towards um, the climate-friendly agenda. Second, um, this is the other side of the coin. And I fully agree with, with your introductory remark, Ani, but also with what was 
Vijay was saying about your concrete experience in Brazil. Um, I think a climate-friendly agenda in cities has to be a human-centered, a citizen-centered agenda. Unless we do it for people and with people, it won't work properly. And this is the issue of inclusiveness. And we still have a many odds at the local level. We have um, planning processes that don't take those citizens on board, that don't give women a voice, and don't actually bring vulnerable people on board when it comes to planning processes, projects, and possibly even if you try to focus to make a transport sector more climate friendly, but is this then really a people-centered approach? Um, and this is actually a, an additional issue that we should actually pursue more, more forcefully. And finally, what of course is key, and we see already a leadership, a big leadership role growing by, by cities. But unless you have really good governance and adequate funding and capacity building put in place, I think we won't reach the impact that we are aspiring to. Um, I'm just coming from another um, side event on cities. It's about the C40 city finance facility where we try really to build up capacity at the city level to develop an investment pipeline towards um, a climate neutral city. It's not only about the funding, but it's also about strengthening the capacities at the communal um, municipality level in order to make sure that the right things are being developed and then put in, into practice. Our lessons learned is we don't have, at the city level, we have to implement a tailor-made approach, a one-by-one -one approach. Um, it doesn't, normally it doesn't, f um, it's not fit for purpose. It's we think this, we have just one model of financing and this has to be applied in each and every city. Um, because even in a country like, for instance, Colombia, we have been working on bike sharing systems and how this could be funded by, by, by cities. And the type of financing option that Medellin opted for is quite different from the one that was affordable for Bogota. And both are very big cities, very important cities in Colombia. But simply, this means this makes it a bit more complicated. It takes a little bit more time. We need more flexibility with respect to the funding vehicles, but it's doable. And actually, um, I think it's worthwhile to pursue this. Um, we have to triple the action at the municipal level in the next eight years. We have doubled it over the last 10 years. We have now to triple it. Um, and I think your report is a good insight to strengthen the other side of the coin to make sure that we, if we now start to upscale investments, wherever the money comes from, that we do it in a citizen-centered way. I'm very glad to hear, Ingrid, your uh, push to triple your focus. I, it's good to remind us the scale we're talking about. There are about approximately 5,000 cities in the world. That's more than 100,000 people. So that's the kind of numbers of cities. 3.5 billion people live in cities today. Um, One billion of them, I'm sure David in our next panel is going to talk about, live in slum-like conditions. Uh, you can't get to 1.5 degrees to, if that continues to happen. Um, so the scale of what we're talking about is enormous. And one of the points I want to focus on next is Africa, the sub-Saharan Africa, where it's one of the fastest growth of cities we are seeing. We're also seeing city growing very differently than we saw urbanization in Asia before that and Latin America before that, that cities are growing um, without the concurrent economic growth that happened in these two places. Um, and also the smaller cities, unlike in Asia, is growing much faster. And we predict more people in Africa will live in smaller cities, which by definition often has less capacity. So I want to introduce Wanjira Mathai. Wanjira leads all our work in Africa and WRI. She's the uh, regional vice president. Uh, Wanjira, from the African perspective, which is this is a central issue right now, of what Vijay was talking about, water, and uh, what will happen to cities that we are very concerned about. What is our way out there? Thanks, Annie. Um, I couldn't agree more with what both Vijay and Ingrid have said, but there's one crucial limiting factor that in many, I, I actually don't know any African city and the Africans in this audience who could disagree with me, where this particular issue is not the limiting factor, the political economy. Understanding the nature of the political economy in African cities is the single most important in how those cities grow and in how they, and who they serve. 
uh, understanding the motivation of why government, local government or otherwise, invest in certain ways is crucial. So the three, the tripling or doubling of investments will only take you as far as the political economy will allow. And so I, and, and at WRI, we're investing significantly, one in understanding the political economy and analyzing what the political economy is like, mapping what the motivation is, who and where are the power structures that control access to these resources, because you will not go anywhere, even with the sort of knowledge and data that we have. I think it was about three months ago that the Central Bank of Kenya was made a decision to invest significantly in pedestrian access in the city of Nairobi. I live in a very green city. It's getting less green, but it is a green city compared to many. And I went and visited with the central bank governor and I asked him, what, does anybody know the plans you have for beautifying Nairobi? And he said, yeah, the plans are in the, in the city of Nairobi. I said, but pedestrians, is there any access to the, you know, I would love to see what you're thinking. And he had no idea where the plans were he was going to invest in those plans to beautify Nairobi. Long story short, when we found out what was about to happen, they were going to plow down all the trees that had been in this area, growing for over 40 years, and plant palm trees. So for whom was this investment being made? And this is happening in our cities over and over again. As we increase investments, as our cities grow, investing in the political economy becomes the single most important so that we can benefit from all of the, the different investments that are coming to, to the cities. And this is happening across the entire continent. So we ignore that piece at our own detriment. The signals that come from local and central government will determine where people move, Annie, and will also determine where investments are actually made and for whom those investments are made. Thank you very much, Wanjira. Your focus on political economy is critical. And also, Ingrid, your point that every city is different, right? The, what we need to do, what we need to understand and act. So how do we do it in scale? How do we get 5,000? So one of the things this particular um, uh, work summarizes is what is the top level view and focus is not on we can't get to where we are in cities and how we're building to where we need to go by making marginal shifts one project here one project there what it argues is we need seven transformations which are common they're di going to be actually different transformations seven common across that um, i'm going to show you a quick video to remind you what they are but before i do that please join me to thank this fantastic and phenomenal panel and we're going to Get off the table, we'll see the video, and we'll go to the next panel. Thank you so much, Vijay, Ingrid, and Alan Gira. Throughout history, cities have concentrated talent, fueled productivity, and nurtured innovation. But today, Soaring inequality is stifling livelihoods and dragging down growth. The World Resources Report towards a more equal city finds seven transformations are needed to change course. Reimagine how core services are provided by prioritizing the vulnerable and partnering with alternative providers. Include the excluded by gathering granular data at local and community levels and recognizing the informal economy and enable transformative change through better targeted financing, effective spatial planning and inclusive, well-coordinated governance. These seven transformations for cities are key to a more equal, more prosperous, more sustainable world.
Thank you. I omitted to introduce myself earlier. I'm uh, Leo Horn Patanotai. I head the London office for uh, WRI. I also lead uh, strategy and partnerships in the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. Pleasure to be here with you today. Um, before we move to our next panel, I'd like to show you another short video, which will dive more deeply into one very concrete example of what um, this agenda looks like on the ground. Uh, video, please. As urbanization accelerates, unplanned growth is leading to disconnected neighborhoods without basic infrastructure and high environmental costs. Expanding access to services with flexible planning standards can foster affordable, livable density. Integrated planning while upgrading most informal settlements in place is key. Creating shared water taps and toilet blocks and adjusting laws for plot sizes and using vacant land can provide quick wins for households and communities. Reliable public transport, safer streets for walking and cycling, and clean energy access can unlock opportunities. Done with climate risks in mind, these changes can drastically improve living conditions and economic and environmental outcomes for all. Thank you very much. Um, panel two, may you please join me on the stage. Well, our, our panel materialized in its entirety at the last minute. This is a <laughs> augur as well for this discussion. So uh, having heard from um, leaders of major institutions driving progress to make um, cities more equal. Uh, we will now dig deeper into what these transformations that we heard about, what does that look like on the ground in cities around the world? And for this panel, I'm joined by an all-star group of leading thought, uh, thought leaders and practitioners on uh, urban change around the world, and um, who will be bringing very concrete perspectives from their innov the innovative solutions that they have been bringing to this um, uh, to urban inequality in their work and, and their institutions. And uh, we'll invite them to share very concrete examples of how this can be done and, and how can these solutions be scaled uh, to make inclusive, resilient urban development the new norm for, for the 21st century. I, I do want to apologize, by the way, for the, um, for the gender imbalance on, on this. Uh, on this uh... Sarah is formidable. She, she, she... So she represents all women, and uh, we thank you for that, Sarah. Women are very well represented today, but we do apologize for, for the imbalance. And it, it is, yes, it is. It's, uh, <laughs> it is a, uh, not for lack of trying, it's an unfortunate uh, last minute scheduling conflicts. Um, so let me introduce very quickly our panel. Uh, joining us today, we have uh, David Dodman, who is the Director for Urban Settlements at. Um, the International Institute for Development, uh, Environment and Development, a sister institution of ours, a leading um, uh, light on, on vulnerability, risk, resilience in cities in the developing world. Um, next to him, repre representing all women in the world, <laughs> is our dear friend Sarah, uh, Sarah Collenbrander, who's a, a noted academic and uh, currently leading um, uh, climate and sustainability at ODI. Uh, previously was head of global programs for the Coalition for Urban Transitions, a partnership of 35 institutions helping make the case and support national governments to do their part to drive the urban change agenda. And next to Sarah, uh, we have Michael Keith uh, from Professor Michael uh, Keith from Oxford University. Um, I forget the number of in initiatives that you're heading, uh, but, but a very notable one that, that stuck with me was the Peak um, Urban Research Program. Um, at Oxford, which involves uh, leading institutes, research institutes from five major economies, China, Colombia, um, South Africa, India, and the UK. So thank you, Professor Keyes, for being with us. Um, Matthew Baldwin, um, Deputy Director General from um, uh, Mobility and Cities at the European Commission. 
thank you for being with us. And Felipe Ramirez, thanks for your, uh, making it just in time. Uh, from Mexico, I guess you're arriving. Sorry? Colombia. Bogota, Bogota, sorry, Bogota. And uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. That, uh, <laughs> it's, it's our Mexico director speaks so fondly of you. I always find it difficult to disentangle. But so um, Felipe is, um, is a, managing, a general manager for Transmilenio, which is a trailblazing and much vaunted uh, bus rapid transit system in Bogota City. Um, so given time constraints, uh, we will uh, pose one question for, for you all to address, and I'll ask you to be um, brief to keep your interventions to around six um, minutes. Um, maybe we should start with you. The question that I'd like to ask you all to, to address is, is this. How, do you, uh, how to embed uh, urban e equity in the planning and implementation of ambitious climate actions, adaptation and mitigation in cities. David, you have um, had a lot of experience working in cities in the informal sector, and I think you have um, deep insight on not just the solutions, but also the processes that are need, need to be in place to drive uh, urban equity. So please. Thanks very much, and um, thanks for setting up this session and for putting um, equity at the center of the discussions here today. I picked up on one particular line in the session description. It said, the critical role of equity and multi-stakeholder partnerships to drive transformative climate action. Um, and what I want to do in my comments is focus on how we can actually include equity considerations in climate um, actions and how this might lead to more just outcomes. And so we know a lot about some of the elements that are going to be necessary for driving resilience in cities. And we know about the importance of adapting the built environment. We know about the importance of social change and behavioral change, um, both for um, moving towards um, uh, zero carbon futures um, and for achieving resilience. So I'm going to pick a few of these things, particularly around adaptation, and ask the question, how might we do these differently if we really are putting equity um, at the center? And this can sometimes be doing things which are not currently done. And it can sometimes be not doing things in um, which we've fallen into avoiding some bad habits and um, bad habits. So firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about social protection because I mean, in certain circles, adaptive social protection really is seen as being one of the central elements in building the resilience of individuals um, and of households. And so asking the question, if we put equity at the center of adaptive social protection in cities, what would we do differently? So we've been doing some work recently in Indoor in India, looking at the um, health impacts of climate change on people working in home-based industries, um, in factories, um, and in the informal economy more broadly. And one of the things which seems to be really critical about um, preventing people in the informal economy from achieving greater resilience is a lack of um, their lack of access to many of the fundamental elements of social protection that other people might be able to take for granted. So things like um, state-based health insurance schemes, um, things like um, food subsidies that are often not available to people because either um, they come from outside of the cities or outside of the region and therefore aren't entitled. Um, or because the measures that are used to identify who is eligible for social protection don't have a solid enough understanding of urban poverty and the centrality of non-income based as well as income based measures of urban poverty. So the answer then, thinking about social protection, um, if we think about equity at the center of that, how do we include both a broader um, set of people horizontally, people who are often excluded from these mechanisms, and broader ex um, inclusion vertically, um, people who might qualify as near poor, but who we nonetheless know are highly vulnerable in cities. And then infrastructure. So we know the importance of adapting the built environment and infrastructure. Um, and uh, many of the um, uh, papers that um, inform the report that Annie's been mentioned speak about infrastructure of various kinds. But what I was really pleased to hear Annie um, bringing up um, and to see here as well is the importance of some of the basic service infrastructure. Because again, an approach to infrastructural resilience which does not take equity at its center 
will prioritize um, the sorts of coastal defenses, the sorts of infrastructure that protect high value, um, high economic value elements of the city. Whereas taking an equity-centered approach to infrastructure, we'll look at the things which are vital to the health and to the well-being of low-income urban residents, including basic service provision. And there's a critical gender dimension of this as well, the importance of basic service provision and the additional burdens that that has tended to place on women in terms of accessing water, accessing sanitation, and providing health care to families. So an equity approach to built environment that will prioritize resilience and adaptation of basic services or of nature-based solutions. And I mean, I think um, Wangjira's comment about who are these trees for is really critical here because nature-based solutions are obviously critical and it's great to see the growing focus on nature-based solutions as being a, an, an element of urban resilience. But in and of themselves, they're not necessarily positive or negative for equity outcomes. And so as we're talking about things like tree planting, the questions need to be asked, who are these trees for? Who is benefiting from them? Whose livelihoods are supported by the coastal restoration projects that might involve um, mangroves? And so we have some great examples, and many of them are from the African continent. I was on a panel with Mayor Akisoya from Freetown talking about the tree planting programs in Freetown and how those are simultaneously addressing the issues of flooding through slowing runoff, high temperatures through um, urban cooling, but also involving people in low incomes in the process of planting and maintaining the trees. So nature-based solutions that incorporate equity concerns rather than ones that might ignore them by being inappropriate both for the context, uh, both for the climate context and for the human context. So that's where I'll stop for now. Thanks, Leo. Well, thank you so much. Um David, this is a great uh, way to start this conversation. You've set out a lot of the different stalls on nature-based solutions, on, on informality. Sarah, I have um, benefited greatly from your encyclopedic knowledge um, and uh, your research uh, as I got my uh, toes wet on, this, uh, on urban issues. And so I thank you for that. I wanted to ask you um, to address the um, economics and financing and policy dimensions that, that you are so knowledgeable about on this um, agenda. So Sarah, please, over to you. Thanks very much, Leo. No pressure at all. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is a huge congratulations to the WRI team for this report. It's really a phenomenal piece of scholarship. And uh, the, I don't think any of the authors are represented here today, Anjali Mahendra, Robin King, Victoria Beard, Michael Westfall, but they did an outstanding job and it is a real resource to anyone looking in this space. I guess the second thing I want to say is that uh, one of the elements that emerges from the report but I think has been missing today is the actual conversation about equity. We've heard a lot about poverty reduction today and about climate proofing cities, but equity requires us to think about the top as well as the bottom. And I think that's a conversation that is often left out of cities, despite the fact that there are those very stark inequalities side by side that were referred to in the first panel. And that's why you need to approach urban policy with a, with a national lens and think through the relationship between your national fiscal, macroeconomic trade policies and how that will play out for what you can do in cities. And whether you're looking at Brazil, South Africa, the UK, what becomes really apparent is that if you have long-term elite capture of key resources, you, it is very difficult to then claw back and establish an equal city. The lock-in that you have in terms of your land choices, the transport infrastructure, the nature of your buildings, it's very difficult to then revert back to something that approaches greater equity. And there's an opportunity around that to create more equal cities if we think through both equity and climate with a national urban lens. So a couple of low-hanging areas of opportunity that I think are worth considering as we think about how to finance the basic service provision, the nature-based solutions, the transport infrastructure, et cetera, are things that would also be great for climate. So as a couple of examples, fossil fuel subsidy reform is well beyond the scope of cities. But it hugely shapes cities because it incentivizes the inefficient consumption in buildings so that people don't invest in energy efficient buildings. It incentivizes car use so you get lock into urban sprawl. Uh, and it creates an elite, particularly in countries that have fossil fuel resources that they produce and extract. 
eradicating fossil fuel subsidies offers an opportunity to free up resources to finance more equal cities and create a more equal society. And obviously the next step beyond that would be carbon pricing. We also heard a comment earlier about the role that property taxes can play, and I think that's a really interesting example. By instinct, one would think that a property tax has the potential to create a more equal city if it's designed in a way that particularly taxes wealth. But a property tax can also have an unequal effect if it's done, for example, as the UK is, in a, in a very regressive model where it doesn't take account of different, different differentiated wealth uh, that can be stored in houses and doesn't sufficiently capture that wealth and redistribute it. And then you get these soaring house prices. Compact cities can also lead to much higher house prices where you have trade-offs between your compact, your, your uh, innovation, your dynamism, your accessibility, but a city that the poor can't afford to live in. And the third example I want to talk about, going back to Arnie's original remarks about why a city forms, is your trade policy. Cities form because people come together to find work. It's, a city is primarily a labor market, uh, even if people subsequently stay for the culture and so on. And so creating trade policies that attract, that create industrial jobs where people have the opportunities to upskill, to work collectively, to mobilize for better conditions, has spillover effects in terms of creating a thriving, productive city where there is wealth to invest in this essential infrastructure, better housing, and so on. And so I think that the important opportunity here as we think about a more equal city is not necessarily to think about how we pay for better services for the poor by the poor, but what our mechanisms of cross subsidization should be so that it's genuinely about equity and not just about poverty reduction. Thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, thank you for reminding us of the urgency of avoiding the lock into urban forms that then make equity outcomes much more difficult to achieve. Um, and also the, the, your key point about the services and, and transport. And um, maybe on that point, um, Felipe, I'd like to turn to you. Um, uh, Transmilenio has been a shining example of, of, of mass uh, transportation uh, solution that, that has as well as a very well-documented um, benefits in terms of bringing down travel times and um, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, also has been transformative in terms of, of inclusion and, and expanding access to uh, urban amenities and services. So we'd love to hear from you what you've learned from the experience of, of Transmilenio that speaks to the question of including uh, embedding equity in, in climate action in, in cities. Well, thank you very much. I, I would like maybe just listen to you guys um, to, to, to tell you about a project that we are actually right now running and I think it's going to be uh, come to reality in just like uh, 15 days actually. And it's a very important one that we are doing right now in, in Transmilenio. As you may know, in Bogota we have right now one of the biggest electric fleets in the world. We just bought 1485 electric buses, and we are really into this kind of uh, change in the city, not just because we, we think it's about providing a better operation system, but also because of climate change, of course. Then this project has shown us that uh, these buses, and of course, giving more um, uh, new elements in terms of operation, also help to people to move better, but we found out that we still need to work in gender equality. And that's where I want to go actually, just after hearing you, because I have just uh, started a project where we will hire uh, in a public operator, just women, for driving all the cars that we have. That's because we found out that women actually do better than guys driving cars and doing maintenance in the, in, the, in the transport system. They do have much better uh, indicators, and we are sure that's uh, something we have to work on. But it's not going just there, and actually you mentioned quite uh, of that. It's also about giving services that help these girls to be able to work in the system. So it's not just about hiring them and training them, because we are already doing that, we have a program for training them in the electric buses, and actually that's also very important because it's going to be like the first um, kind of a school, university, or college, whatever you want to call it, to train these women 
in uh, driving and maintenance of electric cars, which is actually something new in the city. So actually women will be leading this uh, knowledge in, in the city. But also when they are working, how we do to give to provide all services that they need in order to be able to keep working on the transport system. And it's uh, something at least new for me, but uh, finding out that you need to provide uh, uh, little garden schools in the bus depots or laundry spaces or some other services that someone goes and help there for the woman to be able to leave all this uh, care system that they have to carry on, but they can give that to someone and say, okay, you are the one who is going to be involved on this and take care of all what I have to do in my normal life so I can work and I can give this other service, that like driving these buses or doing maintenance. It's something very important. So it's something that I'm quite happy actually right now because it's gonna be 179 buses. It's more than 600 uh, women working in the system in just one operator. And I'm pretty sure, as I told you, being this the first school, the first college for women being trained in this, it's gonna become like a super revolutionary thing in the city. All operators will find out that they want to hire this woman, that they want to have these people in, their, in, their, in the industry, which is actually, an industry that has been four years uh, mainly for uh, men. And that's something that, uh, what, as I said, numbers tell us is not the right way actually. Because girls driving cars show that they have less accidents, that they are doing better, that they are actually more into the users. They are like uh, telling uh, people, users, um, making life better. Because it's also about that, the experience of uh, travel that, we, are, that we, we want to change. And I've been working on that as well. So for me, it's very important that we can manage to change the travel experience that people is having in the city. So this is just like a very important step. And hearing you, I think we are going the right way. And this is something that's going to be provided very soon. I mean, they are being trained or, already. And we will just uh, came to light with this project in 15 days. Thank you, um, uh, Felipe. Um, uh, important point you make about thinking of equity also in the provisioning of the service as, as well as the service uh, being provided itself. But I wonder if maybe a follow-up question, if you can talk a bit to the um, impacts uh, of the equity impacts of the Transmillennial and how those have been tracked and learned from and, and embedded in, in the, the evolution of, 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 um, of the BRT system? Oh, that's actually quite important because in terms of a developing country where before there were not a formal transport system and actually we're finishing right now to make it formal, it was very important in terms of equality. Actually, uh, Transmillennial changed the way people were able to uh, access to work, to education. So people, it's something that I, I, I always explain, like saying, if you don't have transportation in a city where you have to travel more than two or three hours for one trip, then you will have option just to work all around where you live. Mm. And that's gonna be uh, represented in your wage or in your education. So when you have this uh, transport system that allows you to be able to travel all around the city in an easier way and cheap way, well, you will be able to access to all these other uh, things. Of course, we still need much more infrastructure. We're working on that. We are having, uh, we are right now uh, uh, building a lot of infrastructure. We are hiring these uh, amazing new buses that are also helping climate change. So that's going to be helping actually right now the um, economy recovery that we are needing after the pandemic came that it was like uh, the worst thing ever, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, Transmillennial have for sure changed uh, people's life. I would like to actually go maybe to the one of the last projects that we have released uh, beside the, these uh, electric buses that I have just told you, and it's the cable car. Cable car in uh, one of the poorest areas in the in the city just changed the way people was commuting. They were probably spending more than fifty actually one hour for commuting from one point to another. And after cable car arrived, they are spending 
13 hours, 30 minutes, sorry, which is quite good. It, re it reduces like 60% uh, of the time travel, but also not contaminating, but also in a very smooth way where they can read. And actually in these cabins, we, are, uh, we have put a QR uh, system where they can access all the books and they can read while they are traveling. So we are, again, giving more services, not just about commuting, but also improving the way people is also having the experience of travel. Thank you, Felipe. Michael, um, I know that you have worked extensively on transport issues for um, a very long time. No doubt you will have a lot to say um, on, on this issue. But I would also ask you um, maybe to share um, your thoughts as the person at the forefront of um, the uh, EU's ambitious program to lead um, decarbonization in 100 European cities. Um, what lessons or perspectives you would like to share uh, in the European context? Well, thank you very much. It's, it's Matthew, but I forgive you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, got to nail, got to nail the moderator, right? Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, all of us have a different reason for being here at COP, and, and I've been dragging my bag around COP, talking about mobility, talking about climate neutral cities, and those are the two things I want to address in thinking about equity. And I want to tell it in the form of a story, um, because if we're thinking about how to embed equity at the global level, the first thing we can do is not make the same mistakes we've made in the global north. And the first mistake we made when we think about mobility was that what we needed to do was to drive, to hammer huge motorways into the heart of cities. We did that across the United States with interstate highways, and sadly we've done it right here in Glasgow, where you have not one but two motorways at the heart. And it was all because we gave this to engineers. We said, engineers, figure out the most efficient way to do this. Turned out not to be so great because of things like induced demand, and we get blockages, and then you invent congestion. And we haven't been very good about moving people in. Underlying it is the notion that sooner or later everyone's going to have a car, right? Well, no, they're not. So you exclude at a slice uh, a huge number of people from uh, equitable access to, to mobility. More recently, I think uh, we've done better at integrating safety and sustainability into the equation to the point that I think now there's recognition that you can't have true sustainable policies without safety being bedded in. We've already talked about it. If you don't have safe places to walk and cycle, people won't walk and cycle. But more generally, if you look at the external costs underlying mobility, it becomes so clear. Uh, we did a great study with the University of Delft uh, uh, looking at externalities in the European Union, and it's a mind-boggling figure. Somewhere between, and you can argue about the precise quantum, 600 billion and 1 trillion euros a year go on the externalities of our mobility. And very interestingly, around 40% of that is environmental, greenhouse gases, air quality, habitat degradation. 30% of it is congestion, which is 2% of our GDP, and 30% is the cost of road crashes. So if we get serious about sustainable and safe mobility in our cities, we address all those things. And we start indeed to reconstruct cities around active mobility, around public transport, indeed around sustainable health outcomes for all of our population. Then, as we had, the, the epidemic arrives, uh, uh, and the whole impact is accentuated by COVID, and now I think we have a sense of the space in our cities and how that is shared. Cars are getting bigger and bigger. I saw something fast and fantastic on Twitter the other day, which is that the average size of an American pickup truck is now roughly equivalent to a Sherman tank which is very handy when the military takeover comes because they will be able to parallel park the tanks in our cities, right? Um, parking. If you ask any of the mayors flocking through this city, uh, through this, it is a city, by the way, this uh, cop, but if you, if you ask any of the mayors, it is parking space, which is the most controversial, the most difficult issue for them to address. Um, and why? Because it's my space. Well, no, it's not. It's public space, which has been appropriated by cars, and I very much agree with Sarah on this. Here, it is cars which are the, the capital uh, point, and it means that we have to consider equity and equality. So finally on that, we need to look at lots of different aspects to this. Globally, north-south, 
hanging over this entire conference is this issue, and we need to focus on it in cities to make sure that it's equitably shared, both on adaptation and mitigation. Look for the policy linkages. Um, I, I, I once had the honor to ask the Prime Minister of Jordan what his principal problem was, and he said it's youth unemployment around Amman. And when you unpack that, it comes down to the lack of ability to get young people into Oman to access the jobs that do exist through sustainable and safe mobility. Um, look at the road deaths pattern. Road deaths are the biggest killer of 15 to 29 year olds in the world, and that is primarily, I'm afraid, in the global south. Not tuberculosis, not uh, uh, um, uh, diarrhea, not AIDS, road deaths. That is a huge equity issue. Equity within a city. Some people say we need to have cars everywhere because people need them. Well, in the city, two-thirds of the poorest households of Berlin do not have access to a car. 50% of the households where I live in Brussels. Again, this is the elite capture point. Where are pedestrian pavements well constructed? They're constructed well in the rich areas of the city. So even intra-city you have this issue. And the poor are left to stumble over broken paving stones. Racial equality is missing from this. Those of you who haven't seen it, please read Angie, Shit, Angie Schmidt, excuse me, that's an unfortunate mispronunciation. <laughs> Angie Schmidt's work called Right of Way, which looks at the pedestrian provision and looks at the racial uh, uh, inequities in, in the provision of uh, pedestrian facilities. And last but not least, gender equity, which is fundamentally missing from all of our analyses still when we think about these issues. When I come to, <laughs> finally, uh, to, to promote our 100 climate neutral cities. Uh, call for expression of interest coming up in November. If your city is interested, start thinking now because it's going to be, I hope, a breakthrough policy all the way to climate neutrality by 2030. It's going to be very tough, but I hope it's going to be very rewarding for those cities. They will only get there if they develop truly integrated and, and systems-based approaches which put the health the well-being of all the citizens in a truly equitable way right at the heart of that, of, of that policy and that policy making. And if you're out there, we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Matthew. And uh, sincere apologies to all the Michaels and Matthews out there. It's the Michaels who will be really upset. <laughs> <laughs> and the engineers, too. Apologies to the engineers. <laughs> Speaking of which, we have, um, we have an anthropologist with us today, or at least um, Professor um, Math, uh, Michael. <laughs> you, uh, I was interested to learn that you are actually located in the uh, anthropology department in, um, in Oxford University. Which, um, so I wonder if you could um, share your perspective as a professor, having looked at this issue in a very interdisciplinary way. Um, Many thanks, and I share the commendation of the WRI work, which is uh, fantastic on this, this dimension. Um, our homework was actually to answer the question, how can we make equity issues central to the planning and implementation of climate mitigation and adaptation in cities? The simple answer to that question is, it is central. It is always central. The real question, I guess, is whether we make it visible, how we value it, how we understand its complexity, and also how we understand its contradictions. So in that context, I, I'll just try and make four points in the time, short time I've got available. The, f the first is that if we all recognize here that the greatest challenge to humanity is the climate crisis, it is also the case that the greatest change in the way we occupy the globe is the move to cities. That creates a challenge about how we think about the cities of today and the cities of tomorrow. And we know very, very, straight, very straightforwardly that in those cities that are yet to come, there are people who are yet to be born, there are people who are yet to arrive. And what that means, uh, if that is the first point, the second point that then follows is when we're thinking about mitigation and adaptation, as we've already heard today, we know that we have city halls that try and think about sustainability over an electoral cycle or maybe over decades. And we have large numbers of people who are thinking about how you survive by tomorrow or next Monday week. And that creates different kinds of dimensions, but also different kinds of ways of thinking about those futures. Sitting in City Hall, I've run a City Hall for a part of my life, and so I'm not demeaning City Hall. Which one? Um, a part of London, actually. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, that, in that tension between 
City Hall and the, the, the scale of informalities that we've already heard about earlier on. There are people trying to get by with incredibly inventive so solutions to how they get by, but at the same time, there are people trying to make the city look like it ought to rationally. The attempt to rationalize cities has been a moment of hubris through our history, as well as a moment of great achievement at certain times. So how we understand the interplay between these um, two things, these two different ways of thinking about our futures, plays out to the third point I want to make, which is, ties in some work we're doing in Delhi. My colleagues Bawani Buswala and Mayanka Mukherjee, who are doing work, and there's a film on our, our website if you want to see about following plastics and following drains in Delhi. Because we, we, we think about the way the city tries to rationalize. And in that particular, in that particular example, the city will try to um, uh, adapt to climate change in the systems of adaptation by controlling water. And we heard earlier on about the importance of water invariably in these contexts. But trying to rationalize water, you create drains through the cities. And trying to create drains through the cities, you create penumbral regions which are unsafe, which are degraded, but which are also occupied by busties, squatter settlements. And some of the work we're doing is, is looking at the work that is going on there. And some of the people that are moving to that, those cities, if you look at the movement from the great areas like Bihar to, the, to Mumbai or other parts, parts of India, part of this story is a story of climate change. It's not simply a, 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 a single determinism. It's always a two-way street because we know the metabolism of cities and climate change itself play off a, against each other. But part of the story is how the climate crisis plays out into the mass movement of people to cities. And when you look at the rationalization of water and the creation of busties, you also see there inventive ways in which people survive. And those inventive ways frequently involve things like plastics, plastics collection and plastics picking. You follow those plastics. We have a look at the film, as I say, on our, on our site. When you follow the, the plastics, you find that it's a major source of adaptation and employment for large sectors of people there. The city is trying to rationalize, wiping out a lot of the informal plastic sector at the same time as people are surviving on the basis of that plastic sector. So we have to understand most straightforwardly that there are invariably trade-offs. There are invariably dynamics of change. There are invariably tensions and trade-offs between what happens today and what happens tomorrow and what happens in, t in, in 10 years time. And when we're putting equity at the heart of that, we need to think through those multiple registers of, of time, which is why the fourth and final point I'd make, which would echo the point which was made by a colleague from Germany this morning, is that on the, on the one hand, we want to scale up. But we know that these cities are complex systems. They're complex, they're open, so the butterfly effect always works. Small changes produce massive changes as systems interact, which means that what, what that means most straightforwardly is that we have to acknowledge the specificity of geographies and histories of particular situations that demand bespoke solutions to particular challenges, even when the challenges are themselves generic. How one then actually scales up and is at the same time addressing the specific implies this slightly difficult trade-off between recognizing specificity and also acknowledging the generic challenges that, 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 confront, that confront cities. What that in turn demands is that what we have to do is think about learning, knowledge exchange in ways which privilege not just the ivory tower or city hall or the big institutes, but thinks about the, the invention that goes on down on the ground that works with the NGOs in the third sector, with people on the ground to think about how that distance between city hall and the informal world, which may be a matter of a few hundred meters, but is in reality a chasm of life worlds, can be bridged, but also resolved in a way which respects the local, but also recognizes the challenges of the global and in our context today, the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. A great way to wrap up this panel. Um, and thank you all, to all our panelists uh, uh, for, for joining us and sharing our perspectives. Uh, I would love to open this up. And the irony is not lost on me that um, for an event focused on inclusion, we, we don't have time for uh, an inclusive discussion with you all. That said, I do. We are open to engagement and uh, to you joining us on this on this journey. Um, uh, do check us out online for those uh, who are dialing in. Uh, we are at www.citiesforall.org. That should be easy to remember. We also, for people here, uh, have brochures outside. And um, oh yes, there you go. You can follow us on social media as well. And uh, I, I won't even attempt to summarize uh, this rich discussion, but I thought one thing that I really took away uh, is that when we get to 
uh, when we ad advance solutions to urban inequity, we are really getting at the foundations and the structural issues that stand in the way of, of ambitious uh, action on climate with, um, a, and we're really getting to the root of, of a system that reproduces bad outcomes. Uh, the externalities that you mentioned, um, I remember which of the M's uh, <laughs> spoke about that. I think you both did. But um, again, thank you very much. And I would like now to invite um, Ingrid and, and Ani to provide, and, and Vijay to provide some closing remarks. No, please, please come up here. We will vacate the panel. That was a really, really good panel. Uh, and given the 3,000 panels here, that's a high compliment. Um, look, I just wanted to end this by what you just heard from the la last panel. Um, uh, I think Einstein, I think Einstein said, you know, you can't keep doing the same thing, expect a different result. Um, and if you, um, if you really want to transform 5,000, whatever number of cities, we all have to do things differently. Uh, all of us right here. So I wanted to invite uh, people who run very big, important organization to ask them uh, what they're going to do differently. And I want to just, it, it, I'm just not saying that, just taking Sarah and Matthew's point, maybe Matthew left, no, he is there. Or just on cars. They both made the point of, you know, we need to think about an incredible from top and the bottom. Cars, which take 25 square meter and larger on a city, on a city street, is the most undemocratic way you can travel, by far. Like, if democracy was a goal you cared about, you would not have cars. Even in big cities, you heard, in Mumbai, which seems a very fancy city, more than 25% people actually walk to where they need to go to work, 25%. 3% of the public resources on, on infrastructure, 3%, goes to um, sidewalk repair, even less sometimes. So there is no connection between these two. And yesterday was transport day. So one of the big things that's happening in the, is, is increase of electrification of cars, which is very exciting. And you heard about it, it's the fastest growing sectors. There are one billion cars in the world today. And if you didn't do anything, there'll be three billion cars. I'm, ta I'm talking about cars because most people, most, most likely you own one or you know someone who owns one. Um, if all three billion cars were electric, we will, there's no chance of getting to 1.5 degrees. So we actually have to live, build, manage cities differently. So that's, that's the bottom line of what we're talking about. So Vijay, I don't want to put it on the spot. But just briefly, Vijay, just from your perspective, you run a very important, very large, what, what, do we, what do you want to do differently or need to do differently? Uh, I'm going to change my name to Michael, the first thing. <laughs> um, first thing. So, uh, First thing is implementation. I just want to use that. That's, that is what we now need to do. We know a lot of what we need to do. Implement, but in a different way to the past, not make those mistakes again. We have a huge community of people, cities, who want to change, who need to change, and who will be forced to change because of the technological and the climate and the pressures of people coming and their expectations. How do we make sure that the equity points that many of the panelists have said so e uh, eloquently are really made. I think I come back to Wanjira's point on the political economy, because if you don't do that within the decision-making processes themselves, and that comes down to what we do as governments, as diplomats, as development people. So we focus hard on that, but most of all, we actually implement some of it, because in every city there are some things that can be done now, which need to be done now, which will help equity, will help development, will help the poor, will help decarbonization. And that menu is very rich, which is fantastic just do some of these. Um, I think uh, Michael's point on the trade-offs is crucial too, and the kind of butterfly effect. Start somewhere. Having a grand plan that we try and implement everywhere just won't work, and that's not how the diversity and the vibrancy of our cities works. It's intensely local, and we'll, they'll all go on different paths. Um, the second, I just want to come back to what Matthew said, again, brilliantly, um, and it was Matthew this time, it's that one. Um, uh, it feels there is a more revolutionary part to this, which is if you really get rid of cars, well, not get rid of cars, there'll always be cars that's good if they're zero electric, fine. But if the fundamentals of our use of space change, more compact, different use of resources, 
not having um, motorways for the middle of cities. I've just come back from Brasilia, which as a 1968 built place was built for the car. It is going to go through an absolute revolution when people don't need those, and thank God, because you can't even walk across Brasilia easily because it was entirely built for cars. One of the delights of my life has been coming back to London and just not having a car at all. Apart from I feel a little bit richer. Not, not much, I have to say. But also, you know, I cruise like one of those annoying cyclists smugly past the long lines of parked cars and, and traffic in London every day. And that is a delight. But if we're going to go through something as revolutionary as giving up the, I can't remember what figures you had, Matthew, 40, 50% of space and energy and the externalities of that, it feels to me there is a more fundamental rethinking of how do cities run themselves. Again, different for every city, but I take away from this something that we need to start to think. How do we work and share the rather more revolutionary thinking that may be coming faster than cities may be expected to come? And again, completely unplanned, that will have terrible equity effects if it just happens. We have to start to think and understand what those possibilities are and take advantage of those. Thanks. Thank you, Vijay. I, I hope you recorded this. I mean, because it's so good to hear from a high official of the British government of the revolution that's about to come. So thank you, Vijay, for unleashing that. Uh, <laughs> there are revolutions and revolutions. <laughs> Ingrid, do you have? So, Ingrid, how is GIZ going to be different? But I think the first chance that we can actually see is, is as we have heard, and most of the cities, especially in the global south, still have to be built. So we are going to see an urban, um, increase in urban population. It's going to be tremendous. Of course, you, you can see this as a problem, but you could also see a chance. Because this means that by this type of process, you could actually try to leapfrog developments, technologies, and make sure, as you said, that the mistakes of the past that were done in industrialized countries are not, not repeated. But I think we have to seize this chance and start tomorrow, because there's no time to waste. When we continue to develop cities along the patterns that have been established, along the elite capture that is now embedded in cities, we will actually re repeat the mistakes of the past. What does this mean actually for then implementing development agencies? I think we have to be much more actually um, conscious about the underlying patterns and what does this actually mean when we want to create a climate friendly and people centered city. Take it from this vision, from this level of ambition, and then distill the type of action that have to be worked out in different sectors with respect to jobs social services and, and transport and, and mobility. I think that the recover forward process, the time after the pandemic actually also provides us with a huge opportunity. The awareness right now by politi politicians is much higher that we have to deal more consciously with, consciously with the social issues that have now emerged during the pandemic especially also in urban, urban areas in the Global South. This gives us a window of opportunity, an opening, to make sure that we not only address like specific sectoral issues, um, safe transport, safe energy supply, but that we really bring in the human factor. Uh, I see a, a huge opportunity. And additionally, the third point is the digitalization process. We haven't spoken about this today. But this actually offers absolutely new opportunities to change cities in a very smart way. And by the way, my son who lives in Berlin, he is young. Perhaps he should listen much more to the, to the youth. He wouldn't actually consider to buy a car because with modern technology and new models of sharing, it's much easier to deal with mobility um, in, in urban areas. And this is not only a phenomenon of the youth in the north, but you can also see it in the south. Perhaps we should listen as a third, a last message, much more to the next generation that has different, different <laughs> consumption patterns, different actually ambitions and visions how the livelihoods, their life should look like in cities. So this is another lesson that we try to embrace in our approaches and implementation solutions. Thank you. Thank you. This is what the only reason we had Sarah here for the next generation. Yeah, and all women. Yeah. All you. Oh, the gen all the youth gen and yeah. all women. And all smart people represented in one place. Um, I, I just want to say a word about thank you, Ingrid. Uh, a word about WRI. But I, I was so pleased Sarah mentioned um, uh, Anjali Mahendra, who's led this work. Um, 
I, Anjali, I don't know if you're listening to this. Uh, the, she's, um, she's the director of research at Ross Center. And this is this mammoth piece of work is a labor of love. I mean, you don't get this done overnight. So I, she couldn't be here, but I hope, I don't know, this is recorded, transmitted, whatever. I hope you're, you can hear her. She would love, love this conversation. So Sarah, I want to thank you for that. I just want to say two things um, about WRI. I'm just going to speak not in grand visions as what WRI is going to do. I grew up in Delhi. Um, I was happy to hear your India example. And with the time I was growing up in Delhi, Delhi was bursting, meaning it was growing in a very, it's, it hasn't stopped actually, still growing at a rapid pace. Uh, and um, it, the energy of a city you could see, uh, uh, and you couldn't miss it, but you could not also miss, if you, if you were alive and awake, the vast inequality that was actually just next to vast growth that was taking place. Innovation was taking place. So. At that time, I didn't know climate science um, as I was growing up. But since then, now I've learned the climate science, I am convinced you actually cannot get to a successful outcome. And I mean successful, that is a decarbonized world that is good for people and good for nature without actually directly tackling inequality. So from WRI's side, till recently, as uh, some of you know me, uh, I used to run the cities program, which hopefully is very going to be very equitable. But now I get to run the WRI, so I'm kind of thinking what am I going to do differently. One thing I'm going to do differently is that equity. So we are a very pretty known and we are a 40-year organization that's focused on environment and climate, is bring the equity angle centrally to what we want to do in every dimension, from forest to ocean to uh, energy to cities to uh, everything we do so that the outcome we want is as de decarbonization and also better livelihood, better lives uh, for people. So that at least in my small corner of the world, that is what I want to focus on. I hope all of you think about cities and what all of you are going to do. Please thank the fantastic panel. Vijay, Ingrid, thank you for coming back. Thank you for being here.